Hey, what's going on you guys? Sir Burns a lot with Team High Cloud today, and I'm bringing you uh, part two of this tutorial thing I've been uh, thinking about uh, doing for a while, and I just now got into doing it and everything. This is going to be another long video, so go ahead and grab your popcorn, grab you a, grab you a notebook, a pencil, whatever you're going to need, take some notes and everything. Uh, just like the last video, I'm going to be going over a bunch of stuff. Might be a lot to take in at one time. Uh, a lot of you guys probably already know this stuff, but like I said, this kind of tutorial thing that I'm going to be going over is really for the people that are still learning how to play the game. They're still trying to figure the game out um, and trying to figure out how to do build orders and stuff like that. If you didn't see my other video, uh, it was a UNSC tutorial telling you guys about like what each of the leaders do, what their advantages and disadvantages are. A little bit more than what you can get from reading the uh, the book that comes with the game, essentially. Uh, so hopefully you guys will find some kind of stuff out about this. Some stuff you probably, like I said, you probably already know about. And if, uh, if you're that guy that already knows this stuff, then this isn't for you. So uh, just to let you guys know, we do... Uh, we do have that other video up, and like I said, it's the UNSC version of this one. Uh, this one is going to be about uh, this one's going to be about the Covenant. And while I was at work today, I was actually writing some stuff down, getting my uh, my thoughts together, so it wouldn't take forever. Uh, but I found out I had about 35 minutes worth of gameplay that I could upload, so uh, I've got plenty of time to talk about it and everything. So um, we'll go ahead and get into it. Um, I'm going at the end of this video. I'm going to relate the UNSC stuff uh, to the Covenant stuff, just because we're uh, since I don't really want to make an extra video, like a separate video, just for that. So we'll go ahead and get started with this. The first leader I'm going to talk about is going to be the Arbiter. Um, the Arbiter is very popular, whether it's in uh, higher level games, whether it's in uh, just random, just playing against randoms, it really doesn't matter. The Arbiter is very good, he's very popular, and I'm going to go over a few of the things that makes him good, and some of the things that make him not so good, so we're going to go ahead and take a look at that here. Um, I made a pro and con list here, and I'm going to go over all the pros first, and I'm going to do that with every leader, and then we'll go over the cons, and I'll explain it a little bit as I go. Uh, the first thing that I have with the Arbiter is the fact that uh, he can upgrade to Cheap Rage, which means that his leader power is going to, uh, it's not going to cost as much to maintain while still doing the same amount of damage, and it's going to be really, really good. Um, so taking down Warthogs, taking down tanks, stuff like that, it's going to be more cost effective for you to do so with just your Arbiter. Um, you'll probably hear people say they're uh, going to go all RB or something like that. That's essentially saying they're going to build supply pads, maybe... Uh, maybe a shield generator if they have to but normally uh, they're just going to go supply pads and just go with the Arbiter until they get tech 2 and start going into Banshees and stuff then if they feel like it but going all RB that's what that means uh, because of the cheap rage um, now with the rage run ability that brings me to my second point right off the bat as soon as he comes out he is the fastest covenant leader he traverses the map uh, the quickest out of any of the other leaders and my TV is messing up right now uh, my bad. Anyway, the um, once he goes into Rage Run, he's the fastest Covenant leader out of the gate, right out of the temple, uh, regardless of spending money or not. He is the fastest leader that you can get, which is pretty good for uh, pretty good for catching early game units, uh, pretty good for denying uh, hooks and stuff like that. So it's pretty good. Just the fact that he's a speed player like that. Uh, the next thing I want to point out is Suicide Grunts. Uh, the Arbiter Suicide Grunts. Uh, they are good for delaying pads. They're good for taking out Covenant leaders. They're, I mean, they're just good for that kind of stuff. Um, and they're just really good because, I mean, you can slam one into a turret. You can slam one into a pad and almost kill it. You can slam one into a depot to deny a canister shell. Um, you can just uh, delay the players. You can take down summits. Like, it's just really good to be able to play tactically like that with the Suicide Grunts. Um, and... My next point is something that uh, comes into play with being the fast Covenant leader. He's uh, he's really good at denying uh, Covenant hooks and UNSC hooks. Um, just because early game, like let's say you're playing on Beasley's, you're playing as the Arbiter, you spawn across from... Uh, you spawn across from like Anders or something. You know they're going to go Warthogs to take their hooks. You can rage run over there and catch them all and then buy their hook from them. So that's going to set them really far behind. Um, you can also rage run to a hook um, if you think you can get there in time and try to take a hook from the Chieftain if you can get there first. Um, just little stuff like that. He's really good at taking and denying hooks. Um, and that goes along with um, the next point I was going to say. He catches Hogs in 2v2. 
um, in 1v1s. If you can find somebody's hogs while they're taking hooks and stuff like that and catch them and kill them all before they get gunner, uh, after they get gunner, it really doesn't matter. If you can kill their initial hogs and uh, make their numbers lower, it's going to be really good for you. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the glitch to go into quick rage. And what I mean by that, um, I think people have tried to prove whether or not he moves faster when he's in rage mode and i don't really know that he does um but i do know he goes into rage mode a hell of a lot quicker which is really the big point behind it it helps you to get into rage mode before the units can run away from you um and that's kind of a big deal like if somebody comes if uh, somebody drives past you with their hogs normally it'll take you a second to get into rage mode but with the rage glitch you're able to just go into it um so that's kind of a big deal there uh the last thing I have on here, there's a lot of other stuff that you could put, but these are just the big things. Uh, the last thing I put is that he regains health uh, while he's in rage mode. Um, that makes him very survivable. You're not going to really have to ask for heals a bunch of times like the Chieftain would have to. Um, you can go to a rebel base if you wanted to and just raise the turrets down, then raise the base and raise the rebels. You're almost at full health again. So uh, that gives him survivability, which is really good in a Covenant leader. Um, Oh, and not to mention the fact that once he's Tech 3, he's invisible. That's awesome. But that goes without saying. Um, now, with the cons with the Arbiter, uh, with the special unit Suicide Grunts, the Suicide Grunts are only good for killing themselves. They're really not good for much of anything else. Um, if you try to just use their regular attack, you're probably going to find yourself in a world of hurt, and it's not going to be fun. Um, so, yeah, definitely, uh, you definitely want to see what you can do there as far as... Um, as far as trying to use the suicide grunts for what they were intended to do. Don't try to use them for other stuff because it's not going to work out for you. Um, I just got distracted in the video here. Our tanks are getting dicked over here. and other guy's got ear lead. Um, this is going to be an exciting game. Hopefully you guys are paying attention to that as well. Um, but anyway, the next thing I want to point out is that with the Arbiter, since he is in rage mode and he has to, hit, like with rage mode, he can chase stuff down and hit a bunch of stuff. One of his weaknesses, though, is large numbers. So the Arbiter's not really, really good against taking out stuff in large numbers. Like if you go against four or five tanks, um, when they get canny and stuff, you're pretty much going to have a really hard time doing any kind of damage to that. Um, early game, if you can, uh, if somebody spams you with Marines at your base and stuff to try to deny your summits, you're not going to be able to cost effectively rage those down because he's not, uh, he's not able to do a lot of damage to units that are in numbers. Um, another problem with the Arbiter is that the disruption bomb pushes are deadly even once he's tech 3 because once he's tech 3 the biggest threat with the Arbiter is the fact that he can rage if you debomb him he can't do anything plus he doesn't have a lot of health like the Chieftain does so he's really easy to take out unless he gets a lot of veteran C stars or something like that um, another one of the cons is that he can't attack air unless he's in rage mode um, so unless you've got money to spend killing air units the air units are pretty much free to go and do whatever they need so you'll have to spend money to take those down um, and that brings me to my next uh, con which is the last con that I've written down and it's uh, that the Arbiter can get cliffed and if you don't know what that means it's when the Arbiter goes to rage air and the air flies over a mountain or a tree or a cliff or something like that and he'll end up hitting the unit and then falling off of the map and it'll end up killing him and you'll have to rebuild your unit which is really shitty um, Hopefully you guys don't really have to deal with that too much because it's really annoying. Um, but yeah, um, that's pretty much it with the Arby um, as far as uh, the actual leader goes. Um, next, I'm going to talk about the Chieftain. Uh, the Chieftain's got a few. Uh, he's got a few things to mention here uh, in the pros list. He's got uh, the Vortex. The Vortex is very good. Um, it's good at taking out Warthogs. It can take down buildings. It can take down. It can take down everything, and an upgraded vortex is a cost-effective way to get rid of flamethrowers and stuff like that once you upgrade it and everything. So um, the vortex is really, really good. Um, he's also got high hit points, which means he's going to have a lot more health, which is really his way of uh, being survivable, like how the RB can regenerate health as he kills stuff in rage mode. Um, with the chieftain, he just simply has more health than the arbiter does, which is really cool. Um, so he's just pretty much a walking tank. Um, he's also got a stun hammer, and the stun hammer is really good if you can go to the UNSC and camp the front of their base and wait for their first tank. If you can perma stun their first tank, they'll be at a really, really big disadvantage there. 
Also, um, Birthright, that gives you the ability to pull them into you so you'll be able to stun them, uh, which is really, really big because one of the best ways to stop a uh, an inheritance chieftain is to stay away from him stay at a distance kind of try to kite him a little bit do a little bit of damage here and there but once he gets birthright he can pull units to him and perma stun him um so he's going to be you're going to have to build numbers against the chieftain when he's got birthright or else you're not going to be able to take him out also he is the leader that benefits the most from veterancy stars because once the chieftain starts getting stars that's when you want to make sure he doesn't die because the percentage he gets on his health and his damage and stuff is ridiculous because of his base damage and health. Uh, so veterancy stars on the Chieftain are really good. I don't know if you guys have ever had to deal with a three-star Chieftain, but it's really annoying and it's really hard to kill him. You'll use a full pop of uh, cannies on him and he still won't die. And then when he teleports, you're going to feel like a dick. So that's, uh, that's another thing with the Chieftain. Uh, getting to a special unit, he has the Brute Squads, which are, in my opinion, a lot better than the Suicide Grunts. One, they cost a little bit less. I know 10 doesn't really sound like much of an advantage there, but it is less. Um, and they're good at attacking things. They have good damage. They have good health. Um, pretty much everything about them is really good. Uh, the Suicide Grunts, like I said, they're pretty much useless unless you're slamming them into a building. The Brutes can kill buildings, but still have units there. Um, so that's something really good with him. Um, the brutes are really good once you get them upgraded too. Like the jump pack is really good if you're attacking on one side of the base and they bring a tank over there. You can hop completely to the other side of the base, start attacking. By the time they get over there, you hop back over again. It's really funny. Um, and electric shot, that's that's ridiculous. Um, all right, to continue with this, uh, I did mention the arbiter glitch, so I'm going to mention the chieftain glitch here. Um, the chieftain glitch is really only good for um you'll get like a slight micro advantage against stuff but it's not really going to be enough to save you um but what it does allow you to do is it allows you to walk through energy walls so if somebody's uh if somebody's got a garrison like an energy wall or something and you need to do some damage um you can just use the vortex to walk through it if you guys don't know what i'm talking about i do have a video on my channel i think it's my uh my video with the most views on it is the chiefs in glitch i explain how to do it and what it can do and everything so if you guys don't know what i'm talking about you can go check that out real quick um oh shit guys got a lot of banshees over here anyway um moving on uh that's all i put for the chieftain as far as his uh his pros and everything so we'll go ahead and start talking about the uh the cons there's not many um the number one thing is that he's not as effective at chasing hogs or fending hogs off just because hogs are so fast you can't really vortex them down that much um the arbiter can chase stuff down and the prophet um can use his range and stuff to take them out so um he suffers against hogs pretty bad um also, he's slow at traversing the map. He's the only one of the Covenant leaders that at some point in the game, he can't have an upgrade or do anything that makes him travel quicker. He just is going to move the same speed no matter what happens. So that uh, that tends to be an issue. Um, also, uh, he can't uh, target air without the Vortex, which is essentially the same as the Arbiter. But it's worse for him because you can't really catch him with the Vortex. At least with the Arbiter, you can chase the units down and be guaranteed to hit them. With the Vortex, you can miss a lot, which is really annoying. Um, oh, we're chasing uh, chasing some tanks down here. Boom! See how he gains the health and stuff there, and he's gonna. I'm gonna be able to keep attacking this uh, this tank here and getting health off of it, and I'm gonna shrug all these tanks off. See, that's how good the Arby is. The Arby's ridiculous here. I need to just get out of there before I die. But anyway, uh, back to the explanation here. That's that's pretty much it for the Chieftain. There's not really much uh, many holes in his game plan there, except he's slow. But that's to be expected with a unit that's as strong as he is. Um, anyway, moving on, the last leader is the Prophet. Um, the Prophet is hated by so many people, uh, myself included. I don't really like the Prophet that much because there's so many flaws with him. Um, he's the only leader that... I think he has more uh, cons than he does pros here, but we're going to give him a fair a fair trial here. We're going to uh, talk about what he can do, what he can't do, and everything, and uh, just give you guys uh, some options here because he is a viable uh, option, but there's just better options out there. Um, plus, his, his play style is very predictable. Um, the profit, the number one thing that I put up here is that he's good at playing defense because he has Blessed Immolation, which is really, really good at taking out hogs. Uh, plus, it does a pretty good amount of damage for the fact that it's ranged and you're going to be able to attack a bunch of stuff with it. Um, also, 
the, uh, he gets a shield, which is his version of being survivable. Um, instead of getting health back when he rages or having a lot of hit points, he gets a shield. So when the shield starts to get low, you can run away or you can recall, whatever you want to do. Even though he runs away pretty slow, you'll normally end up recalling with the profit. But that's okay. Um, another thing that makes him completely different than the other two is the fact that he has a ranged attack that you do not have to pay for. So that's really awesome that he's able to do that. Um, so you're going to be able to get Blessed Immolation, you can get the other upgrades and everything, and you're going to be able to do work with the Prophet um, just as well as with the other ones, but you're going to be able to do it from range. Um, also, the last pro that I have for him is that he is faster than the Arbiter once he's Tech 3. Once he's flying, he can go over mountains, he can go everywhere. He can fly wherever the hell you want him to go, which makes him faster than the Arbiter. Um, but that's not necessarily a good thing. The Arbiter is a real, he's probably the fastest ground unit, which is really good to have a unit on the ground that can control stuff like that. Um, plus, it's not really that useful all the time that you're going to be able to take your profit off a map and stuff like that. That's not that useful. Um, uh, I keep getting distracted by the game here. Um, we're trying to engage these tanks up here up by their base and everything, so we'll be able to just... Uh, I know playing Defender's Advantage, we'd have more tanks and everything, but... Um, with how they've been playing and everything, I don't want to take any chances here. Um, so I'm just trying to damage their tanks and everything, and uh, I'm running away there because they're getting close to the D-bomb, and I'm not going to be able to do anything. So I tell him he needs to pull his tanks and stuff out, so I think that's what he's going to start doing here. But this was a really good game. It wasn't an extremely high-level game or anything, but um, it was it was just a lot of fun. I have a lot of Banshees here. I'm going to be able to do work. Work. Um, yep, leveling those tanks. But anyway... Um, that's it for the pros. Now let's go ahead and start with the cons here. Um, with the profit, the number one, uh, one of the big things, especially in 1v1s, is the honor guards. The honor guards can't play hook control for shit. Um, and the reason I say that is because they don't have a ranged attack, so when you put them in the hook, they cannot defend themselves at all. With the brute squads, they do a bunch of damage. The grunts, uh, they don't really do a lot of damage, but they do damage at least a little bit. Uh, with the honor guard, he just sits there with an energy sword all posted up in his little crow's nest there and just doesn't fucking do anything. So it's really annoying. Um, another problem with the Prophet is he has very low health. Once that shield's gone, the Prophet is nothing. Like, the Prophet might as not, he might as well not even be there because he has such low health. Um, also, once he gets to tech 3 and he's flying... He's considered a flying unit and a UNS, uh, UNSC, a flying unit and an infantry unit, uh, which makes him counter. He's able to be countered by jackals and anti-air, so he's really easy to counter. It, so it's not even worth getting stars on your profit because they're going to be able to do all kinds of stuff to get rid of you. Um, the leader lock. That is the number one reason I hate the profit. You could have a three-star profit, fully upgraded, doing all kinds of work. All they have to do is build one vamp and drop a disruption bomb and send some units at you and you're going to die and I don't really think that that's balanced at all but honestly if the prophet could just fly around and do whatever he wanted he'd be OP because then I mean the chieftain and the army can't really touch the prophet you have to count on your other units to do it so as long as you use your prophet to keep them on a low population they're not going to be able to fight you with their leader it's just going to be a grind fest until you end up winning um so I don't know the leader lock it's okay you don't really you don't deal with it in 1v1s because they can't use a uh, they can't use a vampire and a disruption bomb in 1v1s. It's impossible. Um, in 2v2s, normally you won't, you'll won't. you never see a double Covey or a double UNSC in 2v2s just because, in my opinion, it's just better to have at least one alien on your team just because it gives you more options with your army. Um, and that's pretty, much, uh, that's pretty much it there with the leader lock because the leader lock is really annoying. Um... My last thing I have is that he's bad against the he's bad against canister shell because he moves so slow when he's on the ground, and that's really the only reason you try to get off the ground is because the canister shell. Because other than that, you're fine. But once tanks get canister shell, they can shit all over your profit. So you have to get them flying pretty quick. And we just killed the Arby there, and that's essentially going to be the end of the game for those of you guys who don't really know what that means. Once that Arby's dead, uh, we've got tank numbers. I've got an Arby, and we've got banshees. We're going to shit all over these tanks. Um, he needs to get his red bar and black bar to the back um but anyway um that's it for the leader analysis here and i'm actually going to move because i'm tired of standing in front of my tv you guys might actually hear my fans and stuff because it's still kind of hot in here it did cool down a little bit the other day but not really a whole bunch here all right about to there we go there we go anyway uh 
that's it for my leader analysis there. Hopefully you guys found that informative. And uh, we're going to go ahead and talk about the Covenant overall and uh, what that's uh, what that means for the game, how the meta's played, and everything like that. So here we go. Um, with the Covenant overall, I wrote down a couple points. I'll just talk about it. Uh, hook control maps uh, with the Covenant, 1v1s or 2v2s, because 3v3s, let's face it, there's just not many hook, uh, hook maps at all. Um, the... Uh, a double haul with the Covenant is very good on these maps. The reason being is that you're going to be able to build infantry out of the center of the base, but you're also going to be able to build infantry out of a haul, uh, which means you're going to be able to make jackals uh, to take the hooks and hold them. Um, if you can take the hooks and hold them until you can get uh, Tech 3 units, um, normally your Tech 3 units are going to be as good as Tech 4 units for the UNSC. Uh, I mean, that's only fair, right? So if that's the case, uh, the UNSC doesn't have a Tech 4 anti-infantry in the barracks, so your jackal is going to be better, um, and that's just my opinion. Uh, we could test it and everything, but that's I don't know the the flashbang from the um, the flamers and stuff that makes them better, but just the overall attack and stuff is not really as it's not really that much better. Um, also, you can transition into hunters versus vehicles after you get hook control established, and they're not going to be able to hit you with tanks. They're not going to be able to hit you with infantry, essentially, so they're going to have to hit you with air. Uh, you can either go into uh, needler grunts and just start spamming the shit out of those, um, or you can recycle one of the halls and go into a, a summit once you get tech 2, and you'll be able to get like four or five vampires out and they're not going to be able to build air against you you just keep spamming the infantry at them and it's just it's just pretty good uh strategy there um also the teleporter with the covenant is extremely overpowered um the teleporter is ridiculous because you can let's say you're using the chieftain you're running around the map you keep your units at your base to play defense you find all their units and they're not at your base. If you want to engage them there, you can just start hot dropping their units in. And they don't know whether to stay there or to run. Because you could have a bunch of stuff at your base. You could have just a little bit of stuff at your base. There's really no way to tell there. So that's one of the big things with the Covenant is that you're going to have that advantage there. Where you can be pretty much two places at one time. Um, let's say you do that and then they come up at your base with some units you can transport your chieftain back and just keep going from there if you have two bases you can teleport all your units into where your chieftain's at sit them at the front of your base and defend they start hitting the other base just recall your chieftain to the other base send all your units through and you're instantly defending in another location that makes expos really really good as a covenant you're going to be able to do a lot there but you don't really have to uh expand with the covenant so that's another luxury there playing as the covenant you're really not going to have to expand um because you're going to have a very good eco and i'm going to get to that in a second um because the temple is in uh that's where you get your tech from the covey um, it's in one building slot, so it's really compact. And if you do the math on it, uh, let's say you build uh, two reactors, so that's 750 with the UNSC, and you upgrade both of them, that's going to be, uh, what is that, 20, what's that, 24, and then, so it's going to be 3150, I believe. Yeah, something like that. 3150. If you upgrade, if you have two advanced reactors, if you do them separately, I'm sure you could save a little bit there. But, that takes up a lot of your pads. So let's say you just do two pad, uh, two reactors, upgrade them. It's going to be thirty one fifty. Uh, with the covenant, it's compacted into one slot. And to get third tech, normally you're never going to have to get third tech because you can finish the game with tech two covenant. Um, you're going to be able to get tech two for five hundred for the cost of the temple. Then upgrade for a thousand so it's going to be 15 to get the next tech is 2000 so that's going to be 35 so if you have to go to tech 3 it's going to be more expensive but it is compacted on the one slot which means if you do let's say that they have one vehicle depot so they have two tech so they have two reactors one vehicle depot that means they have four supply pads if you go temple in one production building that's two out of your seven slots that you get so you can have five warehouses I don't know if you guys are good at math at all, but that's one extra warehouse that you're going to be able to build. It's one extra supply pad that you're going to have over the UNSC if you go with a single production building. Um, which means if you, to, uh, to match up with the UNSC on Eco, you can go with two production buildings. 
because you're going to have four heavy warehouses or heavy supply pads or blessed warehouses, whatever you want to call them. I, I mix them up every here and there. But the uh, the deal here is that you're going to be able to double pump off of the same economy that the Forge or Anders or Cutter, they're going to be able to single pump off of a Tech 2 building. Um, so that means you're going to be able to double pump hunters. You'll be able to double pump banshees, which means that your covey is going to provide numbers for your army. And that goes along with the fact that your, uh, your covenant has more, uh, your covenant has more, uh, how do you say it's uh, population. You have more population with, uh, with the covenant. And that's because they're supposed to be the ones that provide numbers for your team, which is going to be really, really good. Even though they're weaker, you still have a lot more numbers, which means the other team might have better units, but they can only shoot it a couple of your units at a time. If you have more units than them, you have fire coming from more directions, which means you're going to end up doing more damage. Um, or that's, that's the theory anyway. Um, since you're going to be able to either single pump with a better eco or double pump with the same eco, you have the option of whether to have more units or more tech. Um, and it really depends on what you feel like doing. If you're going against tanks and you want to level out the fight early on, you definitely want to get units out quicker uh, because if they show up at your base with two tanks and you don't have any units out, uh, which is completely possible if you go straight into tech two, um, then you're going to be shit out of luck there. Also, uh, also uh, the, uh, the Covey has a really overpowered... Uh, they have really overpowered hull, and they have a really overpowered uh, air, uh, their summit, because they can make anti-air out of their air building, which is really weird, but it's really good. Um, and then the hull, you're able to build jackals, which are really good. You're able to build hunters, which are really, really good, unless you're in 3v3s against power turret, then it's terrible. But did you guys just see that? That supply pad, I can see through the world there. That's awesome. But, uh, but yeah, the Covenant is going to be able to have an advantage there because they're going to be able to um, you're going to have a hall and a summit that you're going to be able to build out of that are really overpowered with the UNSC their vehicle depot is extremely overpowered which means you're going to be going with more vehicles uh, and the hall and the summit both give you options for anti-vehicle which is really good um, now uh, two more things that I wanted to cover was that uh, they have banshees, but banshees, the big thing about them is boost. Uh, boost banshees can traverse the map insanely quick. And what that means is you're going to be able to be at a lot of places in very little time. Uh, and that's really good for map control and making sure the other guy can't get, uh, can't get an expo and, you know, stuff like that. It's just going to be really good. Um, so you're going to be able to deny expos with your banshees and stuff like that. Also, with the Covenant having a leader where you can go and find, like, let's say you're playing on Exile, and you see that uh, one of the little squares or whatever on the screen lights up, you go scout it, you see it's an expo from a Covenant, you can take your brood or your RB to that base and start shutting down the expo because you do so much damage early on because the Covenant is built for early game units. So... The Covenant, since they are built for early game units, they're going to be able to harass. That's normally what you're going to see. You're going to see people with the Brute Rush. You're going to see people with the Suicide Grunt Rush. And you're going to see people playing with the Prophet, and they're going to get shit on. Just kidding. Um, but anyway, uh, so that's really what you're going to look at there. I know a lot of you guys are probably just like, oh, I don't want to be one of those Russian guys, the guys that, you know, they go in and do all this stuff, and they're all super gay about this and uh, sorry to tell you this, but that's how the game was designed to be. In every RTS that you're ever going to play, there's going to be some form of harassment going on. And that's, I mean, that's just plain and simple, cold hard facts. That's just how it is. So if you don't like it, find another game to play because this is how the game works. There's, there's no such thing as a rushing noob. There's no such thing as a rushing faggot. None of that. If you rush, you're playing the game how it's intended to be. You're harassing, you're trying to do as much damage as possible. And if they didn't mean for you to send out units when the game first started, they wouldn't have made the Chieftain, the Arbiter, or the Prophet able to be out in the first 30 seconds of the game. That's just my opinion. So you can take that however you want to take it. So in a recap here, the Arby is pretty good at catching Warthogs. He's really good at running around the map. He's pretty fast. Uh, he can't really play hook control as good as the Brute. The Brute has a lot of hit points. 
Uh, the Brute has the Stun Hammer, Birthright. He can Vortex through walls. It's going to be really good. Um, and the Prophet's really good at playing defense. You can turtle up with the Prophet, get your Blessed Immolation. They can't really use Hogs on you. Uh, you can go straight into um, you can go straight into Tech 2 Wraiths. You can go into whatever you want with the Prophet. The Prophet's really fun to play, but he does have a lot of downsides. He can get Leader Locked. He, uh, he can get Cannied. He can get countered by Anti-Air and Anti-Infantry. So it's it's just uh, however you want to play it, really. Um, but they all have their pluses. They all have stuff that's good about them, stuff that's bad about them. And hopefully you guys enjoyed uh, this video here. I do have about five minutes left, and I'm going to use those five minutes to kind of talk about uh, the leaders in general against each other. Now, we talked in the other video about how Anders is good early game, um, how she gets her upgrades cheaper and stuff like that. Uh, that pretty much puts her on par with the Covenant. Uh, the Covenant is essentially uh, Anders, but you have to play it a little bit different because you have different units. The Covenant are meant for early game. Anders is meant for early game or late game. So that's the big difference there. The Covenant normally against the UNSC late game is going to lose because Covenant really doesn't have many options super late game. Um, you can go into Sacrifice Banshees, but, I mean, that's – you can go into a Scarab, but, I mean, who the – like, you no, you're not going to go into a Scarab. But – that's just how the game um, was intended to be. With your uh, with Forge, Forge is going to get dicked on by the Covenant um, early on. He can be because he's not going to be uh, he's not going to be able to make as many early units to fend stuff off. Granted, um, if you're playing one of your ones, you can go into a barracks and you can defend that way and everything. But normally, the uh, the brute is going to come over or the arbiter uh, arbiter the arbiter is going to try to come over. And uh, they're going to try to deny your fifth building or deny your pads and stuff and make sure that they get an advantage on you, which is going to be huge. So uh, you've got to go barracks in a 1v1 against that. But in 3v3s, uh, pretty much the way that the way that the game works is that the Covenant is normally going to play your early game and uh, Cutter and Forge and Anders. So UNSC in general can all play the late game. The only difference is Anders is really, really good with early game. <laughs> Uh, Cutter is, eh, he's alright with early game. He can still do early game, but Forge is completely committed to the late game. That's just how it is. So, if you kind of take what I've been telling you in the past uh, videos and kind of put this together, it should give you a pretty, uh, it should give you a pretty clear understanding of how the game works, um, a couple of uh, reasons why each leader is good at each thing, and hopefully you're going to be able to make uh, good decisions and stuff with what I've been telling you, and it should be really good for you guys here. So uh, I'm just going to dick these tanks down right here, and he's going to end up quitting pretty soon. I only got a little while left on this video. So uh, like I said, Anders and the Covenant, they're really good for the early game, except for the Prophet. You can play defense with him. Um, and, uh, and, I mean, the Covenant should really be used to complement the UNSC. So if you're using, like, uh, Anders, RB... Let's say you're doing double RB Anders. Then you can either play a very aggressive game or you can play a defensive game because you can defend with both Arbiters and then uh, wait for your uh, your UNSC to get Tech 4, get Chain Amp, and like all this shit, and you'll be able to roll the fuck out. Or you can play early game. The Arbiters can go straight into Banshees. The, um, the Anders can go straight into Goss and then get Candy Tanks and just be super aggressive. Or you could play like... Uh, you could play RB, Forge, Cutter, something like that, where you'd be able to sit back and, you know, play defense a little bit. Wait for your UNSCs to come and uh, wait for your UNSCs to do damage. So really your compositions in 3v3s and 2v2s and stuff like that, you're going to be able to uh, see just by what the leader composition is what they're going to be good at. Like if, let's say in 2v2 you go against a Cutter Brute, you know they're going to have they can either have a really, really good early game or they can have like a semi-good early game and then a good late game. Um, if you're Anders Arby, they can have either a really good early game or a really good late game. If you're 3v3, you go against a double Covey, they can put a lot of pressure on early. If you go against a double UNSC, they're going to play a really, really good defensive game if that's what they're into, but normally a double UNSC is going to play defense. So... 
that's just my opinion on everything. Hopefully it was pretty informative for you guys. I only got about 20 seconds left in this video, so not really going to be able to go into too much else. But uh, like I said, hopefully you guys enjoyed this. Stay tuned for the next videos and stuff. Um, I'm going to be doing some tutorials on some maps and stuff to teach you guys like what's good on what maps and what to do in certain situations and stuff like that. Uh, so you guys take it easy and have a good day.